Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show, we're talking about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Supergirl, as well as the latest episode of The Walking Dead. Like always, if I'm talking about something you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I go to Tom when I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I say about this week's episode of Supergirl, you can skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of The Walking Dead. But the first thing I want to talk about is this week's episode of Supergirl. A very interesting episode. Let's kind of break it all down. Why do they make this episode so unique? Because it is a very villain-centric episode, and I feel like that hasn't really come up in Supergirl. Like, obviously Supergirl's given time to shine for its villains, but, like, obviously there was a lot of backstory. It was kind of showing, like, oh, like, how a villain can start off a decent person and become... You, this, you can see and understand. You don't have to agree with it, but you can understand why they went down the path that they did. Um... It's interesting on many different levels because it goes back to just something that the president actually told Supergirl what, like, was that last episode or was it episode before? I think it was last episode, the whole aspect of, mo we like, monsters are born, like, what was it? Where there, when there are none, you know? So it's like, you took this mad person who was actually a decent person, you know, Ben, who... Decent person who was actually pretty equal when it came to aliens because he didn't appreciate the fact is that his dad would call them roaches and that his son would call them roaches. So there's that. A lot of interesting things just even acting wise with all this situation. For one, uh, Xander uh, Berkeley plays uh, Peter Ben's dad. And uh, obviously uh, he's popped up in many things, but most notably recently you'd probably say it's playing Gregory on The Walking Dead. Uh, so, I won't, man, I won't talk too much on that. It's just kind of interesting because I'm also covering The Walking Dead and stuff like that, too. So, it's just kind of funny how that worked out. But, obviously, Sam Whitworth, I think is probably how you properly pronounce his last name. I hope I'm not mispronouncing it wrong. So many things Sam's been in. Um, they, one of the things, you know, you kind of best know him from is, like, at least for me, is uh, Aiden from the North American adaptation of Being Human. Which is so interesting now I'm sitting here thinking about it. I didn't even think about that. That's super funny. Like, just that he was part of that show. And that, I'm, makes you wonder on some level, does that play into the casting for it? I'm sure another reason for it is because in Smallville, he played the human uh, host to Doomsday. Which is, once again, interesting in its own regard. Because let's not also forget, like, that's kind of what's... Spoilers, that's kind of going where Krypton's kind of heading. Because, like, Doomsday was kind of revealed in Season 1. And he's, like, definitely will pop up in Season 2. It's, it's a whole thing. So there's that. But then, once again, it kind of goes back to the whole being human thing, too. Of being like, oh, in the regards to the TV show. But also the concept of, oh, being human and stuff like that. It's just funny when you actually think about that. So I think that's kind of like a nice little wink and a nudge. I know that's probably most likely me thinking too much about it. I'm sure it goes as far as, like, the Smallville thing and just stops there. It's like, oh, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Because, obviously, they've done that from time to time all across the show of, like, doing these interesting casting choices and stuff like that. Just because it's like, oh, yeah, especially, like, people who've connected to, you know, connections to Smallville. So, you get what I'm trying to say. So, I thought that was kind of interesting. But, like, him, like, his slow progression. Because it is a situation that, basically, this is all built over the course of three seasons worth of events. Everything ranging from the Myriad situation, the uh, Kryptonian invasion, to the Daxamites, to the next, well, the Dark Kryptonian uh, invasion. And so, it was kind of enough is enough. Just It was just one thing after another. His family's business kind of feeling, in particular his dad's, because his dad was using steel, but there was like a new metal called new metal uh, that was kind of being brought in by aliens and stuff like that. The dad didn't want to go in that direction. Ben kind of did. He get like it turns into a whole thing of like immediately. He, it's kind of interesting because I feel like we didn't really see that until season two. But to be fair, like a lot of that kind of balances like because a lot of that happened like immediately around season two where the whole alien situation really escalated a lot more of like, oh, people being anti-alien and stuff like that, because it wasn't even really a thing. Yeah, I mean, because you wouldn't know it's a thing because it's like Supergirl and Superman are held in such high regards, and because they look human, not many people think about it. But like I said, this show, as well as men, is still kind of put a perspective in me that I never thought about before of them literally being gods amongst men, just how crazy powerful and how very few things, if anything on Earth, could really counter them unless it's like some super high power tech. But even that, it's like Kryptonians are crazy powerful under the yellow sun. So there's a whole thing. Yeah, that, I mean, just showing you like the hate was already kind of there and it just took certain circumstances. Like just things kind of fell apart for him bit by bit. 
Uh, he had an interesting per- perspective on like, oh yeah, like always say like, oh progress is good, it's awesome and stuff like that. Yeah, but at the same time, think about the negative side, like who has to pay the price for progress. But I think you also have that's very like broad and very one sided to look at that too, because it's like, oh, you're talking about looking at the other side, but there's plenty plenty of times where it's like, no progress is a hundred percent good because well, I mean nothing's a hundred percent good, but it's like for you to be like, oh well, what is that? I mean, you could apply that to a lot of human history of like, oh, progress is bad. And it's, oh, but who did it screw over? It's like, well, what about these people who were 100% saved and okay because progress happened? So it's kind of like, it's almost like he gave it this much thought, but he didn't go beyond that. You know what I mean? There's like an extra layer of like, if you want to look at it from that perspective, you know, like he treats it almost like there is like, yes, this shade of gray, but he doesn't realize it's like he's on the the edges of the shade of gray, not realizing there's even darker shades of it. You, I know I'm like talking in circles around that and kind of, I'm sure that's super confusing, but it's just, it's just kind of an interesting thing to me. Like I said, he is just, once again, like I said, it's just one of those villains where it's like, it's one of those things in a sense of like you, it's not like you went out of your way to make this villain. Like I said, it's just kind of like he got, he, it, it's just like, hey, you're in one of those places. I mean, to be fair, it's a worldwide invasion, so it's not like you're going to escape it. Because I was about to say, it's like you're in one of those cities where it's like super villains kind of run rampant. It's kind of like, you know, people in, uh, you know, Metropolis have to be like, yeah, aliens aren't our big issues. There are plenty of homegrown threats and super villains causing enough mayhem on their own without us having to even worry about it. I mean, the fact is we don't tackle it too much, but there's plenty of like magical, supernatural, and science fictional stuff just happening on Earth without alien interference that you have to kind of worry about, especially like, you know, you, you hitting up Gotham or anything like that. You know what I mean? So... But it, it, it's just kind of like a national city thing specifically. It's like obviously Supergirl being this alien show and stuff like that. It's just kind of funny when you just think about the grand scheme of the DC universe. It's kind of like aliens. You're kind of acting like, oh, oh, they came to this planet. It's like there's so much more bubbling beneath the surface and stuff like that. And just that has happened on this earth that you should be worried about too. But you're so focused on aliens. It's just, it's just kind of funny to me in the, in the long run. But... um. I actually kind of lost track of what I, the point I was trying to make. Right, getting back to what I was trying to say was like, the fact is, it's that thing of like, the other side of it that's kind of interesting, it's like, you always get focused on like, oh yeah, the superhero is saving the day and stuff like that, but it is the other side of things, and that kind of plays a part in the story of like, those stories never get told about the people who are suffering, because because John was literally fighting a Daxamite and these people, the Lockwood's home literally caught on fire and stuff got destroyed because of that. You can make the argument, it's like, it's not, I mean, the bike thing is like, okay, that, that's one thing, but it's like your house and at the same time, it's like, oh yeah, that doesn't get covered by insurance. Like, that's literally the whole premise behind that uh, show, Powerless, as well as like, apparently that's a big thing and like, I think the comic books, not necessarily a big thing, but I think in the comic books in general, just like people that exist to help, like, it's like, oh, the citizens that get caught up in living in places like that and the whole aspect of like, how do you, you know, everyday life for people who live in a place that literally, once again, been invaded three times by aliens. So it's like, once again, you can understand, I'm not going to hold that against a whole bunch of aliens because there's plenty of people that are just living their lives. They didn't like ask to be a part of this and stuff like that. Because it's like, let's not forget you want to blame aliens. It's because it's like, because even like uh, his son, uh, Ben's son, George was like, oh, Supergirl was safe. It's like, no, she's an alien like the ones you're invading. Yes, but she's the alien that's doing good. That's stopping the bad aliens that are trying to kill you all. But at the same time, it's like, you get so consumed with rage that you're not willing to see anything else. Because obviously he turns a blind eye to Elcorp because for him it's like Elcorp, Lena turned her back on their family because it's like, well, no, like your family works with Steel. Like Elcorp and your family have had a long standing relationship for the past 20 years, but we have to cut it short because we have to be moving forward with the future. Hey, your family could do the same thing, but you know, it's like your dad's a good businessman, he'll figure it out, but it never worked out for him. He even went to as far as letting himself die just because it's kind of like, oh, like I have no place in this world. Like Steel's kind of run its course and so have I. And that just pushes Ben to go even further to the point that they have attacked and killed aliens way before he ended up becoming uh the agent of liberty, which is so interesting to me because that whole situation is like, it's not like he became that and then he sought out Mercy and Otis. It's like, no, 
uh, the quite opposite. They sought him out. To be fair, he was already kind of doing a little radical stuff here and there. Um, it's actually interesting stuff here and there. Like, obviously, he even brings up, like, the whole, like, oh, yeah, why is the FBI working with Supergirl? So it's like, like I said, it's just little things of paranoia and just, like, it's just so interesting how, like, your perspective can shift. Because it, it's cool thing, too, is it's not like, oh, man, this was over, like, a short, short period of time. It's like, no, they, they spaced it out. It went from, like, two two years to two months ago. And I thought that was kind of a nice, like, little time window to see him, like, change a little bit. He's a little aggravated. Obviously, he's saying some very xenophobic things at one point in time. It gets worse and worse, you know. So, it's always just kind of an interesting thing. Like I said, you get to really understand why and who he is and why he became the way he is. Um, it's actually kind of a shame like you know like i said he started off kind of a decent person but then like you know it just takes the wrong set of events to lead someone down the wrong path and it makes you wonder when this is all said and done like will there be any redemption for him because obviously like you had car doing whatever she could to save sam it would have been easy just to kill sam but it's like no what i'd rather do is try to save her it's like could you try and save someone who is literally actively spreading hate against you and what you represent the fact is that you want to represent unity and hope you know and that kind of, they're kind of spitting on that and kind of warping everyone's pers minds into fit their perspective of not having a very open mind willing to see both sides of the argument so it's just kind of an interesting thing in itself you know cuz it's easy to kind of feel like like i said you can understand and sympathize why someone feels the way they do doesn't mean you have to agree with it. Like I said, I can understand why he became the villain he did, but at the same time, I don't agree with what, what he's doing because of it, because it kind of sullies everything you're doing because it's trying to make it seem like, oh, you have this grandiose design of like, oh, I'm doing what's right for people, but at the same time, it's like you're using other people's pain as your own ammunition because you're just making it seem like, oh, yeah, like I'm doing this because of other people. It's like, no, you got screwed over and now you're pissed and you're lashing out. Which am I saying? Are you? Are you? Is it not understandable why you're lashing out? It's like no, but the fact is that you're lashing out at everyone, people who are not responsible, that people who are just trying to live their lives. You're talking about how you're trying to just live your life, and you're the thing you're complaining about these people doing to you. You're doing to them. It's like oh, how dare they defend themselves? That's kind of the whole thing. But that getting back to it, it's like oh, I kind of went off on the tangent there, so I do apologize. But it's kind of like interesting because it's like. Mercy and them sought him out. And so I know this is all connected to Cadmus and stuff like that. But I may I wonder who else is in charge. I would, I'm assuming Mercy would be in charge. But she's like, oh, the people I work with. So it's like, even she takes orders from someone else. I guess like Agent Liberty, Ben, is just a figurehead. I mean, I guess that's kind of like the whole point of like the mask and stuff like that. Where it's like anyone can pick up the moniker. Anyone can um be that like that might be what they kind of eventually set this character up to be like kind of a symbol much like the symbol on superman and supergirl's chest being a symbol of hope you know what uh the agent of liberty's uh symbol ends up being so i don't know i'm very interested to see like what that all means going forward because it's interesting because mercy and otis are like oh yeah let's kill jensen because we don't need him anymore and you have sam um uh, i was about to call it uh, sam by his real name uh, ben it's like no 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 he's a human we can use him to get into the deo now my my perspective on that comes down to two things like either one you want to go inside a deo so you can basically release all the secret files they have on everything basically expose them for the fact is that like oh they've been covering all, all this alien stuff how many people like because obviously the DEO probably has records of all the different alien species, what they're capable of doing, who a lot of them are. So, you know, I'd assume there's some government record of that, potentially. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of aliens that potentially have registered in that type of situation. Maybe. And then there's the whole thing of, like, maybe it's just... Uh, I mean, obviously, probably just destroying the building, too, because it's like, oh, what this organization represents and getting people to kind of turn against them for it, probably turn the government against them. Because uh, I'm very curious to see what happens with the whole new you know, the vice president becoming a president. Like, obviously, it seems like he's good with Supergirl, but we'll see whether anything in the future will shift his perspective or his thoughts on the subject, or will he be a consistently good guy? I don't know. Ultimately, we'll kind of have to wait and see. Maybe he'll have some words to say if they end up exposing some stuff about the DEO. What was also interesting is when Lena showed up at uh, Ben's father's funeral, and Ben was kind of like, 
you know, oh, don't, we don't need your charity now. We, she's like, I'm just trying to help. She's like, don't go down this path. You'll become like my brother. And you're like, but they're not human. Once again, it's like, that's how it kind of all fits together. Once again, uh, Lex just became hyper-focused on one particular alien, whereas they're kind of spreading everywhere across the board. So hence why Mercy likes him a lot. So like I said, I'm curious to see who ends up being the head honcho of this. Not less uh, Lillian is running things behind prison. I doubt that. There's still uh, quite a few people we still don't know about, like uh, Hank Henshaw, the real one, uh, Cyborg Superman. We haven't seen him since season two. And there's still the whole uh, Jeremiah situation of, you know, Alex's dad. So there's a lot to kind of unravel about that. I mean, obviously, this has to be Cadmus. So, and like I said, I'd be so interested to see, like, where all that's you know, going forward. It's kind of interesting, too, because they even kind of try to take the Jimmy situation and use that as, like, furthering their point of, like, oh, yeah, look at Jimmy. He's 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 a human, and he's here on Earth protecting humans. We need to protect human lives, not rely on some aliens, blah, 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 blah. What's also interesting is Supergirl's situation. I didn't realize, I guess because I thought because it was such a small amount, it wouldn't have the wide effect it has. It's like, nope, that is literally spread into all of the Earth's atmosphere, not just over National City. So Supergirl is nowhere, can, no, not safe on any point, place on Earth. All of it's already like heavily in her system. So Lena shows up, and I love the, like Alex being like, I know you don't see eye to eye, but Lena's like, don't worry, I, I care. A lot of people might think I don't. But she puts her in the suit that's kind of so, shown in the promotional material for the show, uh, for this season. It's like, oh, it's meant to keep her safe, which is sad. Because also, it's like, yeah, it keeps her safe and stuff like that. But it's like, she has to stay in that suit indefinitely until they fix the atmosphere issue, which, how do you fix that? Who knows? Uh, but what's so interesting about that, though, is because that means she can't go back to being Kara. Even if, she, obviously, she go get better, everything will be okay, but it's like she can't go back to being Kara while on Earth until that situation gets fixed, and that's crazy to think about. I mean, I guess, like, Brainiac doesn't have his Legion ring, because you would think this might be a time to, like, fling her into the future so that they could help her out and that, but maybe that's not the case, you know? Well, once again, too, it's like, oh, you need a spaceship for that. It's not just the ring. Once again, because I think some continuity changes that because, like, they needed a spaceship to time travel. But it's like, well, maybe because it's time travel and traveling across planets. But I think it was mainly like the time travel thing. Like, because I'm pretty sure, like, in some continuities, they make it so the Legion rings literally travel, teleport you through time. I thought that was the case. I don't even know if I talked about that at all last season. Maybe I did. I don't I don't remember. But uh, nevertheless, so that's definitely going to be interesting because a lot of people are going to ask, oh yeah, where's Kara at? And then Jimmy's going to have to cover for that. So that's definitely going to be interesting. So I'm very interested to see what the next episode has a store for us with all of this. What ultimately uh, the agent of Liberty, Agent Liberty's whole plan ends up being about for the DEO. I'm also curious to see what his family thinks. Obviously, he's probably living a normal life. Cause I don't think we, like, in that time as he got more and more radical, as time got closer and closer to present day, they cut less and less to his family. So we don't know what the state of his family is like, whether they're really in a good position or not, or whether it's just a situation. Like, obviously, like, maybe their perspective is kind of swayed over much like his. We don't know. We never got to see whether they got radicalized or not. Like, how does he explain... Well, I'm sure he, you know, much like a superhero, he's got, you know, it's like, oh, I'm off working in this case. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm a I'm a super villain, but I'm uh, I'm off doing this at these hours. Don't wait up for me, honey, type of thing. I don't know. That's kind of my thought. Like I said, we'll ultimately have to wait to see what goes down in the next episode for all of that. And now moving on to this week's episode of The Walking Dead. A lot of interesting things went down this episode, so let's break everything bit by bit. Obviously, things have not been going well all across many different fronts. First of all, water's rushing through, so problems with the bridge. There's already the situation with the sanctuary, so it's kind of like they don't have the manpower to handle it. Plus, just the conditions where it is right now, it's not advisable to work on a bridge. I did like that little moment between Rick and Eugene where Eugene's like apologize. He's saying all this smart stuff and Rick's just kind of like, okay. But he's like, I'm sorry. You know, if I read more books, maybe I'd handle this situation better. But then Rick is like, no, don't ever kind of – basically, it's like don't sell yourself short. Don't think just because it's like, oh, because you, you got here because you read books. It's like you've built so much. That basically we are here right now because of you. So uh, don't kind of 
like I said, don't sell yourself short because everything is everything. It's, I forgot what it was exactly that Rick was saying, but it kind of, you see it kind of put a little, like a little, huh, little hum in um, Eugene a little bit. I, I don't know why I said like that, a hum in Eugene. I don't know why, whatever. And then you also have Carol leaving because she's going back to the kingdom because she's not going back to the sanctuary because the sanctuary wants to have nothing to do with them. She even said it herself like, most of them don't even want Negan back. Like I said, there are some few who do, but it's just kind of like, hey, they have to fend for themselves. They have to figure out who they want to be. And because that's the thing, in the grand scheme of all of this, that's all they're all trying to do. They're all trying to figure out who they are. They're all trying to do their best. Because even Rick's like, hoping, you know, everything can work out. Because even for him, it's like, even when it's all said and done, he's like, Carol is kind of his hope to kind of keep going. Because I guess it's like, because out of anyone, because Carol is one of those characters who shifted the most. If you compare her from who she was at the beginning of this series to being this like crazy, powerful, strong-willed woman that she has that's gotten her this far, I think for Rick, that's always been kind of inspiring. But even Carol's like, even I'm at this point in time still trying to figure out who I am Like in all of this. I think we all are. You are, me, everyone, you know, so... She's sorry. She's like, I really wish this can work. And Rick's like, you know, I know, I know. And it's just kind of, like I said, it's just kind of all falling apart in that regard. Then there's the whole Maggie situation, which that was kind of an interesting conversation because I thought so too, because I was like, Jesus seems to be against it now. But I was like, it seemed like you were so for it at the end of uh, season eight's finale. But it's like, no, for him, it's like he still believes Rick made the wrong decision not killing Negan. But in that regards, it's more like, I don't want you to make the same mistake, like killing Negan right now. I want you to make sure that it's the right decision because for him, it's like Rick should have never made that decision. The decision whether Negan should live or die should not have rested on him because he's not someone, I guess. Yeah, you've lost people personally to Negan, but it was more so like the most important person to you in this case was Carl. You didn't lose him to Negan, um, kind of lost him to this world, but like. Maggie, it's like her or anyone else, but Maggie in particular because she wanted him dead more so than anything. It should have been her who got who ultimately decided. If she decided it was like, okay, Negan gets to live, then okay. But because it was her right, because Rick had no right in that situation. But in this case, it's like, Maggie, you have to make sure what you're doing is the right thing, you know, because ultimately when it's all said and done, Rick ends up explaining this later on. To Daryl because him and Daryl kind of have it out, duke it out to a certain extent. Well, more so they tumble and land in a pit. But it turns into the whole conversation of like, Rick's trying to say like, oh, I understand what Maggie's going through. I see what she's going through. Like, he's, I, it's like yeah, like I didn't see it when she hung Gregory. I knew like what that all meant and what that represented. I saw it. But he's like, but look, I mean, do you really? Are you so blind? Because I think you're so blind to it. Because like, do you forget all that Glenn did for you? If it wasn't for Glenn, you never would have found Laura. You never would have found Carl. Hell, you wouldn't have found us. None of us would be right here if it wasn't for Glenn. Because Glenn's the one that went out of his way to make sure to help Rick back then. And Rick is like, I'm not, I haven't forgotten anything, you know, it's like that, he thinks about it every day, what Maggie lost, what everyone lost, but the fact of the matter is for him, it's like, if we kill Negan, we'll make him a martyr, and that's going to start things up, and then like, you know, if we keep him alive, we can make it so that people use this as a symbol to be like, oh, this, things are never going to go back to the way Negan had him, but then, you know, and that saying, if we leave him alive, then that's going to cause people to kind of think that things could go back to the way they were. But then you have Daryl being like, no, having him locked up gives people the courage that things could go back to the way they were. And because for Rick, like it's all this is about, like the fact that it matters, if they kill Negan, then that means a war is going to break out again. And when that does, that means literally everyone that died and sacrificed himself to get us to this moment. It will all be in for nothing. That would have been like Carl's sacrifice would have been for nothing. And then, you know, Daryl's like, the fact of the matter is you want us to have faith in other people, but it's like you don't have faith in us. He's like, of course I do. Now, I'm curious, is he kind of representing the fact is trying to say that you don't have enough faith in us to be the ones to just end everything. Like, you need to put your faith in Negan being the symbol to end everything rather than just killing Negan and letting us be the symbol to like stop everyone, you can't. You don't have enough faith in us. The fact of the matter is, you're 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 holding on to Carl so tight. He's gone. You have to let him go. You're doing all of this for someone that's no longer alive. Kind of saying like, 
you're not doing this as much for the living as you're really doing this more so for the dead is kind of what that's all kind of saying because he's like the fact of the matter is like he's there was like i would die for you you know if it came down to i would have died for carl you know and i thought that was kind of a powerful moment of him being he's like you know we would have followed you and because rick's like i never asked to lead or any of you to follow and he's like yeah we know maybe you should have you know because it's like Cause that is true. Cause Rick never, Rick just kind of flew by the seat of his pants. Cause he never really volunteered to be a leader. He tried to do what he thought was kind of right, and everyone else kind of agreed with him. So, luckily, him and Daryl kind of got were able to manage to get out of the pit as it was filling up with walkers and everything like that. But still, that is just like I said, it's a complicated situation. You 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 can understand both sides of it. And once again, it's like kind of what Carol was saying, like, no one knows what they're really doing in this situation, it's kind of hard to say what is right and wrong, like, this whole situation, there is a lot, there's no, like, black and gray, this whole situation, I mean, no black and white, this situation is very gray, is what I meant to say, because on the other side of things, even, uh, at the, um, camp, we see, uh, people from the sanctuary coming back, the home dude kind of leading the force with a gun and everything, they basically piece it together about Oceanside being the ones behind it. Also, Rick now knows that, too, because of the whole Daryl conversation. So it turns into that thing of, like, you know, the dude's talking about Carol got a lucky shot on, which is like, no, nah, dude, not, not lucky. The fact that she aimed where she was was lucky for you because she decided, no, she wasn't going to kill you. She could easily put one right between your eyes. Uh, don't underestimate Carol. She's a badass. You don't just get lucky. She's skilled. Um... But we see some stuff kind of like shots go off and stuff like that. And it seems like things are escalating. We don't know what the aftermath is at because we never cut back to it. So we don't know what that can mean in the end for everything. Like who might have survived, who might have gotten hurt, who could have died. Uh, I have some thoughts. Uh, just on just in the back of my mind, I'm like, Jerry, just because it just just to kind of gut punch you. I feel like, cause we, you know, one of the people they focus on, they kept cutting back to was Jerry kind of about ready to pull out his gun or something. So I feel like Jerry might have gotten hit in that scuffle, but we don't know who else, you know, was was going to go down in that regard. So we'll have to wait and see for that. Um, on another side of things, we had the whole Michonne and Negan thing, which was very interesting. I mean, because in general, like, when it comes to this whole thing, like, Michonne's kind of had to be the one to bear most of the weight when it comes to, like, handling Alexandria being a leader, trying to create laws and stuff like that. But for her, it gets a little much, so, a little suffocating, so she has to go outside, she starts killing the dead, because that's kind of where she started at, you know? It's like, not only is she handling this stuff by herself, but also it's just kind of like, that's not her environment. Like, being a warrior fighting is kind of what her thing is. That ends up turning into an interesting conversation between her and Negan, because Negan won't eat, because he's like, yeah, I mean, not because I don't want to eat, but it's just kind of, I want to talk. And the fact of the matter is, if I end up dying, then that kind of breaks the structure to everything that you're trying to build, so... They talk. He talks about Lucille and then, you know, and Michonne talks about Andre saying that basically it's a good thing that they're dead because those people would not have survived in this world and they would have made them weak. Losing them actually made them stronger and made them what they are. It's like we're warriors. Bars and walls suffocate us. They kill us. But out there we get to be us. Which even later on Michonne kind of talks about it being like, no. The difference between us, yes, we are similar in the sense of we get shit done. But the fact of the matter is you get off to it. Me, yeah, I get strength from the dead, but I live for the living, you know? And it's kind of interesting, just a whole perspective on it. Because they even have that little conversation about Carl. Because he's like, I never had a kid, but if I did, I'd want it to be someone like Carl. It's like, you're lucky. And then Michelle's kind of like, yeah, we were. You know? The fact is, Carl's gone, but like I see him in everything uh, we are trying to build. He's like, even me here in the cell, she's like, everything. You know, so, which is so interesting that he's trying to have all this in-depth conversation with Michonne because he feels like out of anybody she can understand him the most, but more so than anything, it was meant to be like, oh, he thought like she would be the last hope he had of getting Lucille because for him, Lucille is a representation of everything that he lost. It's so interesting, all this conversation about letting go and even Negan has a hard time letting go because that's what Lucille represents everything that he had in his life before, like his wife and everything. And he needs that because he's been separated for, from it for so long. And just to think that this bad, toughy 
guy, you know, this guy who seemed like he had the world by the balls is now just kind of crippled by the fact this that like, oh man, I don't have my this thing with me, you know? It's just it's fascinating. But I guess it's just because there was even this interesting moment where Michonne was using her sword at the beginning and then she switched to use a bat and she saw it and she just dropped it. I guess it was just too much of a reminder of Negan that she did that. It almost looked like if you looked at it from one frame, it looked like, at least like when she was holding it at one point, it looked like it already had the barbed wire around it. So I was like, oh, is that uh, Lucille? But I was thinking like, no, maybe it's just kind of like, maybe she just saw it like that because she was looking at the bat. Or maybe it's just because, I think it might have also just been like the guts and brains around it just made me think and feel like that anyway. But in actuality, I mean, definitely when it landed, it was like, oh no, that's just a regular bat with blood and guts. on. But I don't know if like when I was looking at it before, mistaking it for Lu- Lucille or not, was that kind of in her head or just seeing it like that or did it just was it just the blood and guts on it that made me think that so what ends up happening is Negan ends up bashing his head in it's hard to say what he plans on doing by that it's like you know force because it forces them to kind of keep an eye on him or I guess it's supposed to be like bend to my will or I will kill myself and then this kind of undoes all you want anyway you got me to eat again sure but now I can just bash my head in or maybe it's like they'll have no choice but to take him to somewhere to get medical treatment I guess they could do it in the cell but I, I have no idea what exactly he has planned which is interesting because let's not forget there's the whole like uh, Maggie making her way there it is kind of interesting that it was Jesus that kind of I kind of had a feeling as Maggie was leaving you see the look on Jesus's face like even he like was wasn't sure because he felt like Maggie wasn't thinking about what was the right thing you know because it's like oh like she was literally doing the same thing as Rick where she you know in in his mind he was doing the right thing for everyone but that wasn't his decision to make and in his case I guess uh, Jesus feels like this isn't her situation to do it either because like that's that time and place to do it was then that would have been her choice but this choice now it's not hers anymore I think that's kind of how he feels about it uh, so that was kind of interesting and then on the other side of things are the whole Anne and Gabriel thing now that whole situation makes me kind of rethink the whole A and B thing is that I mean it might still be what I brought up last episode of being kind of like either an alpha or beta type of situation but what I'm curious is is it supposed to be like oh you find an alpha or like they wanted an A they want an alpha so you take it someone who's like an alpha and you turn them into a walker maybe it's like something uh you know because obviously they do that whole thing of they kind of turn gladiator like uh walkers is that what that whole thing was about is that what that is it's meant to turn like give you these walker weapons or something like that or warriors like i i like i said i thought my thought process last uh episode was kind of like on point about the whole alpha you know a's and b's maybe that's still true but i feel like the fact is that she was going to let a walker bite gabriel maybe kind of go like so there's a walker element to the whole a and b thing i don't know because obviously, because she felt like she couldn't go back. Once again, it's the whole aspect of like, they didn't trust me. So what can I do? I can't do anything. Uh, you know, I have no place else to go, you know. But Gabriel's kind of like, I'm sorry. You know, I kind of wasn't there for you, essentially. And uh, I forgive you if you can forgive. Me. Even if you can't forgive me, I forgive you. I hope that someday you can. Um, but she doesn't. And then she just knocks him out. And when he wakes up, she's gone. I like that line, though, of like... If you want to tra- travel faster, go by yourself. But if you want to travel further, travel together. I have to tra- uh, travel faster. So she's going alone is kind of what she's implying. But you see Gabriel kind of fall apart a little bit because it's like, I, you know, he really had to think. For, I mean, once again, we don't know how long has passed in between seasons. So, like, they probably really did get, like, really attached. So, But I'm curious, is, like, is she going to try and get to that place? I mean, she doesn't have the A or B that she wants. Like, I guess because she feels like after what she's done, there's like, because she, because Gabriel's going to tell Rick, and for her, it's kind of like, there's no going back for that, so it's kind of like, she tried her best to fit in, but it's just kind of like, she tried her best to change, but it's like, for her, it kind of came undone anyway, so that's why she's just kind of like, I have to go, so where that place is, it must be someone, obviously, she can reach on foot, it'll probably definitely take a while, but I'm so curious to see what that ends up being about, you know? And then there's the craziness behind Rick trying to uh, kite all those those groups of walkers, those hordes, um, 
because he's not trying to destroy the bridge because he's not trying to undo because for him it's like if they undo that bridge they destroy that bridge it undoes all the hard work and all the time and effort they've put into it so it's like i'm not going to sacrifice that just to get rid of these hordes so he tried to lead them away but ends up in the middle of the two horse flips out and he ends up falling and landing on some rebar and kind of passes out from the pain and blood loss i assume while two hordes are closing in and is like yo what the hell how do you get out of that situation it kind of seems like they're leaning towards like oh you don't but i'm sure that's that's obviously the whole point because it's to make you think like oh yeah this is obviously the big red herring of like man how do you i mean you gotta already everyone can see that okay this is a red herring so like how is he going to get out of this because i honestly don't see how you're going to get out of this not unless daryl shows up because it's like nah i didn't go that way like i planned to not unless someone else catches up with him i don't know not unless he gets up by sheer will alone who knows we'll kind of have to wait to see what ends up happening in that regard because uh, i have no idea because it definitely looks scary for him but i'm curious to see what the circumstances are going to be around for him getting out of that you know and what goes for it with all this stuff like the sanctuary who they want to be and what they want to be along with like the whole like attacking uh that like you know camp and stuff where uh carol was and stuff you know and what happens with this whole Maggie and Negan situation. What about Negan bashing his head? And what about Michonne? It seems like she kind of is set in her mind. So it doesn't seem like she's as rocking the boat. Like her situation doesn't seem, doesn't seem as rocking the boat as much as everyone else's. What's also interesting too is their little side note of like uh, Georgie sent another letter that uh, Maggie never read. Which makes you go, okay. So I'm wondering is there like some seriously pertinent in- pertinent information that's in that that Maggie didn't should have read before she left we'll see uh what goes down in the next episode if there's anything correlating to that or not but really that's all I want to talk about to the next time we meet be happy be safe love light to the full so enjoy it good day and goodbye